When Donald Trump first refused to concede the election in 2020, Republicans in Congress didn't really know what to do with it. At the time, a lot of Republicans just kept their mouths shut, hoping that Trump would eventually give up. But there were also the Republicans who went all in, who started scheming with the Trump White House about how to keep Joe Biden from being certified as a duly elected president. And there was one congressman in particular who was way out in front of that effort, organizing a number of his colleagues to sign on to a highly dubious lawsuit challenging Biden's victory in four key swing states. Republican lawmakers are getting behind the suit, leading that effort on Capitol Hill as Congressman Mike Johnson. Let's talk about the suit. What's behind it? There is a lot of irregularity, fraud, and, and hijinks, let's be frank about it. Look, we, we're going to have a, a landslide of House Republicans who are going to sign on to our amicus brief to support this. Mike Johnson, then a little-known congressman from Louisiana, was the driving force behind congressional Republican efforts to overturn the 2020 election. He was the architect of a key part of Trump's legal strategy in trying to get election results thrown out. And when House Republicans eventually ousted Speaker Kevin McCarthy and ultimately settled on Mike Johnson to fill McCarthy's position, reporters tried to ask Johnson about his role in trying to overturn the election. This is what that looked like. Republicans booing a reporter, telling her to shut up because they did not want to talk about Mike Johnson's role in the big lie. Flash forward to today. Mike Johnson has been Speaker of the House for nearly six months. And because the life cycle of a Republican House Speaker is roughly that of a fruit fly, Mike Johnson is already facing revolt among the far right members of his own party. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has introduced a resolution to oust Speaker Johnson the same way the MAGA hardliners ousted Kevin McCarthy. And so Speaker Johnson decided to try and shore up support from conservatives by embracing, once again, election lies. Today, the embattled speaker flew to Mar-a-Lago, where he and Donald Trump gathered reporters in a strange candelabra-filled room in Palm Beach to talk about election integrity. That is the party's preferred term for its lies about stolen elections. But Johnson and Trump weren't there to talk about the big lie that you may have grown accustomed to hearing about at this point. Instead, they offered a new version of the big lie, an updated version 2.0 that weaves together existing election conspiracies with Trump's other favorite conspiracy theory, the so-called migrant takeover of the United States. An election integrity is tied to border, the lack of border security. Among the problems that flows from this Open border catastrophe is directly related to this threat to our election integrity. We believe that one of their designs, one of the reasons for this open border, which everybody asks all around the country, why would they do this? Because they want to turn these people into voters. Venezuela, uh, it's happening with the Congo, it's happening with countries all over Africa, Asia, South America, all over the world it's happening. Our country is like a dumping ground. They're coming from Venezuela, the Congo, Africa, Asia, South America. Democrats are shipping in brown people from all over the world to turn them into illegal voters. Elaborate and also wildly untrue. People who come to this country seeking a better life for themselves and their families do not willingly risk deportation just to vote for Democrats. It just does not happen. The Brennan Center for Justice Analysis of the 2016 election found that out of 23.5 million votes cast, there were just 30 instances in which non-citizen votes were suspected. That's just the instances where it was suspected. The actual number is likely even smaller. Even conservative think tanks like the Cato Institute have found that non-citizens don't illegally vote in detectable numbers. But that reality doesn't matter to Donald Trump and Mike Johnson. They need an election lie that motivates their base. And so they've traded in the false conspiracies about black and brown people rigging the election in Atlanta and Detroit and Philadelphia for a new narrative, one where brown people from all over the global south are invading the United States just to vote for Democrats. And it's not just Mike Johnson and Donald Trump. 
The Republican National Committee, now led by Trump's daughter-in-law, Law Laura Trump, is now running robocalls pushing this exact same nonsense. Hello, I'm Stephanie calling for the Republican National Committee co-chair Lara Trump. I'm sure you agree with co-chair Trump that we cannot allow the chaos and questions of the 2020 election to ever happen again. If Democrats have their way, your vote could be canceled out by someone who isn't even an American citizen. As preposterous as this theory is, it appears to be convincing people, including some very influential people. One of the richest men in the world, Elon Musk, who I will note is himself an immigrant to the United States has repeatedly pushed the false claim that Democrats are trying to ship in voters from other countries. Musk has blasted that message to his millions of followers on the social media platform he owns and controls. And now he will be assisted in this insanity by the leader of the House of Representatives and one of the two frontrunners for the U.S. presidency. Joining me now is Melissa Murray, MSNBC legal analyst and NYU law professor, and John Heilman, MSNBC national affairs analyst and host of the Hell and High Water podcast. Thank you both for being here this evening as we sift through the chaos once again of what happened to Mar-a-Lago. John, um, that's one word for it. Yeah, I'm yeah. being you. It's a family program. Um, yeah. If you didn't like election, the big lie 1.0, mm -hmm. there apparently is a 2.0. Is it an upgrade? What do you think of it? <laughs> I mean, it's more outlandish. Is it more effective? I mean, is it is it uh, if it's if the question is, does it animate Trump's base? Mm -hmm. It definitely does. If the question is, does it make uh, voters who are in the middle of the electorate, who are uh, a lot of the suburban voters who won the election for Joe Biden, along with big turnout from the base in 2020, and who, in a lot of quarters, have been drifting kind of they're, tack, they're back towards Trump. They're yeah. in and out. They're in and out. They don't like Biden's economy. They're not with Biden. But what, every time that Trump does this kind of thing, it just reminds people of something in our amnesiac country that can't remember what happened last Tuesday. They can't, you know, like, oh, yeah, Donald Trump wasn't so bad. The Trump years weren't so bad. We see this in the polling all the time. When Trump does this, mm -hmm. it's making it about him. And when he makes it about him, he makes it about your word, chaos. And chaos in the suburbs of Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Milwaukee, in the suburbs of Atlanta, chaos is not what those kind of soft Republican voters want. It's why they ran away from him in 2020. And he keeps pushing it in their face. Yeah. It's a real risk for him politically. And I don't think it helps on, on net. I don't think it helps at all. But, I mean, there is also the bigger question of what it does to our democracy, right? I mean, the after effect of 2020 and the big lie is voter suppression laws enacted across the country. And, I, you know, when you hear about the RNC and these 18, there's, they have 18 election integrity lawsuits across the country, there was a response to the preposterous falsehoods that were circulated by the Republican Party and Donald Trump, and, and state legislatures responded. Should we be paying more attention to this? No, I think we have to pay more attention to this. Um, you know, it's not an unfamiliar trope that they are rehashing. It's not terribly original. It's the kind of thing that you typically would find cooked up in a meth lab of conservative grievance, this idea that all of these new arrivistes from the global south are replacing your vote. I mean, it's kind of a species of replacement theory, yeah. and it's meant to trade on the same fears of demographic change and losing your country. And the response, I think, has been quite swift and immediate. Um, there are more poll watchers who are now authorized to be there, and not only are they watching the polls, they might be intimidating yeah. certain voters from casting their votes. Uh, there are more laws now that require individuals to provide more proof to show that they they are not non-citizens, and even though we know that the prospects of non-citizens voting is glancingly rare, the incentives are terrible for non-citizens to vote. You, you won't change the election with your vote, and you could be deported or go to jail. So, I mean, the incentives don't play out. But it has cashed out in a wave of laws that are designed to suppress the vote among certain voters under the auspices of limiting election fraud and election fraud that doesn't happen. Yeah, that solving a problem that doesn't exist. There's also, when we compare it to 2020, John, I mean, you know, in the aftermath of, of, of January 6th, there was, for a minute at least, uh, the institutional firmament of, of the GOP rejected the narrative that they, you know, that, that, that it, it, they rejected January 6th, and to some degree they rejected some of the big lie. That all changed. Kevin McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago, took a photo. There's not even that pretense anymore. Right. There is Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, having a press conference to talk about proposed legislation to deal with the problem that doesn't exist, which is more outlandish than 
I think many other theories we've heard from the GOP. Well, let's let's be clear. I mean, look, it, this is the least surprising thing in the world in the sense that Mike Johnson is was one of the yeah. not, was not just a follower, not just a, a lemming on the big lie and on the attempt to overturn the election. He was the one of the primary architects of the big lie and the strategy to put in the fake electors. This is a guy who's been down with that program from the very beginning. It's yeah. part of the reason why he's speaker now. He has no other quali qualifications to be speaker. He doesn't know anything about the speaker, about the House and how it works. He's made, probably learned a few things in the however years since he's been speaker, but. Even been that long? It's, it has been to think about that long at this point. But he's not someone who, on the basis of anything else, would qualify. Unlike Kevin McCarthy, at least who would put it all the time, who understood parliamentary procedure. Mike Johnson is there for one reason. He's the most big lie-ish, most MAGA-y candidate who survived that carnage that they inflicted on themselves a year ago. So to have him down there doing this is not surprising. I will say it's incredible, though, because just on a purely political basis, you don't get to stay speaker if Republicans don't keep control of the House. Yeah. And everything Donald Trump is doing, I, what, he wants to get rid of Obamacare. He shoots down the infrastructure, the, the, the border, the immigration and border bill. He's tanking Ukraine aid. He's going against everything Mitch McConnell thinks is in the interest of the Republican, uh, the Republican majority. Donald Trump is tanking, including Mike Johnson's own FISA thing this I, week. It's like, and my, it's like here, Trump's. The humiliation is absolute. It's, it's incredible and it's politically toxic. It's, he is, just does things that are for, by whim, by caprice, and that are, in his view, good for him. But he is guaranteeing with every move that the Republicans will not still be in the majority after November. And, hey, Mike, guess what? If you're not the majority, you're not, the speaker. you're not the speaker anymore. So it's not even cra it's, it's craven politically, but it's also incredibly, it's like suicidal. Yes, it's cutting off your nose and eating it. To spite your face. I had to say that. Yum, Melissa, yum. To that end, the one thing that John left off that laundry list of like ridiculous things Republicans are taking a knee on at the behest of Donald Trump, abortion, right? In the same press conference, Trump is asked about his position. Uh, there's two pieces of sound, control room. I want to play the one where he talks about what is happening at the state level and the harmony therein. Can we please play that? What we did was give it back to the states, and now the states are working their way through it. And you're going, you're having some very, very beautiful harmony, to be honest with you. You have, well, you have some cases like Arizona that went back to like 1864 or something like that, and a judge made a ruling, but that's going to be changed by government. Okay. First, what? First of all, we, it's not on the ballot yet. It would be changed by the voters, yeah. not the government. Is it a beautiful harmony? What was that? So that was a word salad. Um, you know, if harmony is the sounds of women bleeding out in parking lots because they're septic and they can't get the treatment that they need after a miscarriage, and I guess that's harmony. To this Donald is, Trump's ears. Well, I mean, this is someone who doesn't understand how government works, like literally how a bill becomes a law, and also has no idea what the reproductive cycle is. I mean, it's like, are you there, God? It's me, Donald Trump. And that's a real problem. But the Republicans are taking a knee on abortion in large part, I think, because Donald Trump knows he doesn't need a Republican House or a Republican Senate to further curtail right. abortion rights. We have this zombie Comstock law lying in wait. And all Donald Trump needs to reanimate that and to activate a nationwide ban on abortion and indeed any implement that might be used for abortion is to get his new Department of Justice with his new AG to begin reprioritizing the enforcement of the Comstock Act. So people need to get hip to that. He, does, he can afford to lose Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson is completely expendable because he can afford to lose Congress. Right. He can do this the other way, the way the hardcore members of his base would be happy to have him do it. Well, and quite clearly, he doesn't want any actual Republican legislation to pass, which is why he's killing all of it in well, the run-up to the presidency. you don't need a Republican legislature if you have right. the courts. I'm just, he has no interest yes. in it. The governance doesn't seem to be of right. the essence here. Right. It, it's which is, minority which is, rule. Which is an argument that also applies to the thing that he cares about most of all, which is keeping himself out of prison. Yes. Um, all he needs, doesn't need Republican House or yeah. Republican Senate for that. He just needs that attorney general, that sweet, sweet Cash Bill, Patel. The worst, the worst version of Bill Barr. The other part of it, John, that just should not be ignored is he was asked about Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't think we have time to play the sound, oh, but just please. said, do, we're getting, do we have, I don't think we have time. I'm sorry. Okay. We're going to keep you guys here for a long time tonight. We do have time. Let's play it. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> do you support Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to vacate or do you stand behind Stephen Johnson? We're getting along very well with the speaker, and I get along very well with Marjorie. Uh, we have a speaker. Uh, he was voted in, and it was a complicated process. And uh, I think very, uh, it's not uh, not an easy situation for any speaker. 
I think he's doing a very good job. He's doing uh, about as good as you're going to do. And uh, I'm sure that Marjorie understands that. She's a very good friend of mine. To have Donald Trump as your father figure, what must that be like? Again, I say, if you're Mike Johnson and you watched what happened, Kevin McCarthy, who toadied to Donald Trump for years um, in order to, he, he would have my back. You know, I went to Mar-a-Lago, and when it come when the chips are down, I'll have Trump behind me. Trump was like, see you later. I don't care about you, Kevin. Bye. Mike Johnson, is, does he think that this is going to, that Trump is going to come to his rescue um, when Trump quietly is saying to Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, take him out? He's not, Donald Trump is not going to be, dude, Mike, you know, earth to Mike Johnson. Donald Trump has betrayed everyone who has ever supplicated themselves in front of him. Everybody who does it, they all think somehow it's gonna, they're going to be different. They are never different. And Mike Johnson is definitely not going to be different. Word to the wise. We thought that when you said you supported the 1864 ban, you meant it. Why such a drastic change in the way you talked about it? I want to know what you say to people who trusted you and believed in you. And why are you against that America? Well, let me thank you for the question. First of all, I am pro life. This has not been a good week for Republican Senate candidate and Trump ally Carrie Lake. On Tuesday, Arizona's top court reinstated an abortion ban from 160 years ago. When slavery was the law of the land, only white men could vote and Arizona wasn't actually a state. The ban criminalizes virtually all abortions with no exceptions for rape or incest. And Carrie Lake was a big proponent of that law. I'm incredibly thrilled that we are going to have a great law that's already on the books. So it will prohibit abortion in Arizona. That was two years ago when Carrie Lake was running for Arizona governor. But now when she is running for Arizona senator, the great law has actually become the law of the land. And it is deeply, profoundly unpopular. So yesterday, Carrie Lake changed her mind. But if you look at where the population is on this, a full ban on abortion is not where the people are. The issue is less about banning abortion and more about saving babies. Are you following this? Pro-life Carrie Lake, who previously called the Civil War era abortion ban a great law, is now claiming that the law is not where the people are. She even reportedly called on Arizona state legislators to repeal it, which has landed her in some very hot water with conservative anti-choice voters. And that is what you saw in that clip we played earlier, where she's getting booed effectively. It could have just ended there, but it didn't. To prove her credentials with the allegedly pro-family wing of her party, Lake this week touted a new and amazing policy. In Hungary, what they did I thought was so amazing. They started with their tax rate. And when you get married, they give you a cut in your tax rate. When you have your first child, they give you another cut. By the time a mother has four children, she never pays taxes again. That's called a baby bonus. I think we should do that here in America. Okay, first of all, the reason Hungary's authoritarian dictator Viktor Orban is trying to encourage native mothers to have multiple offspring is because he is engaged in a white Christian nationalist project of repopulating his country with white Christians. And as part of that, he has pursued an aggressively fascistic agenda of keeping out black and brown migrants. Setting all of that aside, the policy that Carrie Lake thinks is so amazing, that tax cut for people who have kids, is literally something we have here in America. It's called the child tax credit, and lawmakers have recently proposed expanding it. But right now, right at this very moment, in fact, the Senate and Senate Republicans in particular are trying to block it. Here's the quote. Senate Republicans are inching closer to burying a bipartisan bill to expand the child tax credit. The top Republican in the Senate Finance Committee said it would create too much entitlement. It appears that Carrie Lake's know-nothingness about reproductive health care extends to a know-nothingness about a lot of other things, too.
Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.